We have uh, two more presentations today, very different from one another. Uh, we have one presentation that is on your schedule, and then our mystery presentation. Um, I asked again, one of my guesses was inventor of the Snuggie, not a correct guess. So that is not our final speaker. All right. Um, so next up is a return speaker here at BBW. We loved him so much. Uh, the powers that be have brought him back. Uh, James Mullen is with GDR. He'll be talking to us about new store concepts and formats and what it means to BBW. Help me welcome James. Okay, I'm going to move really fast as I normally do because I've got lots to cover and we're running a bit late. Um, but I've, first thing I want to say is I've seen some really good speakers today, really, really good speakers actually. And I think um, I've been inspired and I've learned a lot. And I think it's just fantastic. I go to, I spend my life based on a plane, going from client to client. And actually, not many clients do this kind of thing. So first of all, it's pretty awesome. So I would congratulate you for working here. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do today is what we've talked about loads of really interesting things, but what we haven't actually talked about yet is stores. So I'm going to try and bring us back to, I guess, the bread and butter of what we do. And I'm going to start, though, by bringing us back to giving us a reason to get involved. It's the end of the day. We're kind of probably a bit tired. And I can't remember if I've shown you this data before in some of the sessions I've done in the past. I may have done, because it's a couple of years old. It's from Bank of America. But um, this is some analysis of how young people, millennials in blue, and the rest of the US in red, in their leisure time, interact with uh, the things in their lives, i.e. their smartphone, and the people in their lives, like their other half, parents, friends, children, co-workers. And interestingly, we've heard about Gen Z or post-gen earlier. Um, even when it's millennials now, the thing they interact with most is their smartphone. And based on the questions that Scott was asking, I got the feeling that most of you are not Gen Z or post-gen post, post, whatever we're calling it now. Most of you probably sit in the millennials or, or Gen X bracket. But whether or not you're a millennial right now, I want you to pretend like you are. So grab your mobile phone. You always have it with you, like at your fifth limb, whatever it is. And we're going to use this now to interact, because there's no time for Q&A. I've got to be quick. I'm going to give you four chances to interact with uh, me during this session. So I want you to go to Slido. It's sli.do on your whatever your web browser is, Firefox, Safari, whatever the default is on your phone. Or you can type in slido.com. So like that, sli.do or slido.com. And once you get in, it'll ask you to enter a code. Um, the code today, and I'll explain why I picked this in a second, is Highway, capital H, like you can see it here. So hopefully you're getting this, OK? Get your phones out, find your, the, the Slido, type in highway with a capital H, and this will allow you to vote. There's two um, parts on this. You'll see questions and polls. Ignore questions today. We've got no time. Click on polls. And in a minute, I'm going to populate a few polls that you guys can vote in. And by magic, fingers crossed, we'll see this live on the screen. It'll be kind of fun. Um, so uh, first things first, why did I pick uh, highway? Let me stand here so the clicker works. Um, well, I was always trying to find a reason to keep things local, what's going on in the local area. And I was looking at news for Columbus, Ohio. Um, you're not right at the top of the agenda, I'll be honest. But there were a few things that caught my eye um, when I was looking. Um, and I thought this was kind of an interesting story. Your highway patrol people who ever run the highways have clearly got a sense of humor. Because you're, I don't know if you guys have seen this driving back from home. They're using these signs to tell kind of nice stories to slow people down. My favorite of these uh, was this one. You're visiting the in-laws, slow down, you'll get there late. <laughs> um, so that's why I went with highway. Um, and we're going to use this now to vote. So you'll go into the polls tab, like I say. And the first question I'm going to ask you is, how are you feeling this Friday? Are you feeling, I'll, I'll populate this in a second. Are you feeling 100% absolutely energized? What a day, you've learned loads. Are you feeling a bit like, meh? It's sort of end of the week, I'm knackered. Or you like 40%, I'm totally over this already. Just get me a gin and tonic. So let's have a look. You can now vote. Click the one you want, click send. And by magic, we'll see like a little horse race. You're energized. Most of you are energized. A couple of you are like, wanted to be Friday two days ago. But most of you are like, eh, I'm OK. Um, but this isn't, it's not too bad. Um, I should say these are anonymous. So Luciano will never know which way you vote. If you want to be Friday two days ago, you've got away with it. Um, OK, most of you are like, OK, well, I'll try and get you guys energized a little bit. We'll use this a little bit more sensibly as we go through this session. Um, right, stores, actual physical stores. We haven't really talked about these today at all. And it's worth reminding ourselves what the point of a store is. 
So traditionally, whether you wanted to buy a car or a toothbrush or a candle, you had to go to a physical space. And of course, there are different shapes and sizes, but fundamentally, the store was the one mediating point between your demand for a product and your ability to have it supplied to you. Um, but now, of course, uh, that traditional role is totally fragmented. This is not news to you. You still have stores, of course, but there's everything from social to vending to e-commerce to you name it, all these new DMVBs we were hearing about before. How you get your hands and interact with brands is totally changing. Um, and this is obviously, we, again, not, not, not news to you. The way we buy things and interact with brands now isn't something that just happens in stores or more recently, of course, on websites. Now, retail happens everywhere. So this is IKEA's Place app where you can literally put IKEA products in your home using AR. Um, this is China where most of the um, beggars now have QR codes to allow you to give them money uh, through your mobile device, like Alipay or whatever. Um, in London, you've got contactless cards for paying buskers because you know who carries a change anymore. So retail happens absolutely everywhere. Um, the car is suddenly becoming a real channel that everyone's looking at because we spend a lot of time in our cars. Um, and so why aren't we using that as a channel for sales? Uh, General Motors now allows you to buy your Dunkin' Donuts and your Starbucks direct from the dashboard when you're on your way. And you swing into the drive through It's already paid for you. Just pick it up and go. Um, and Uber now, uh, there's uh, for drivers with uh, 4.5 stars or above. In San Francisco, they're now starting to roll out these cargo, effectively mini vending machines into your car that allow you to pick up a snack on the go uh, and it's all charged through the Uber app. That image is out of date now. It's actually through the Uber app and the driver gets some additional revenue. He gets 20% of whatever you sell. So these are now channels for retail. No longer stores, no longer websites, happening everywhere. Domino's, I won't bore you talking about Domino's too much again because I've talked about them before, but they are the great example of a brand that is no longer considered itself a, a traditional retailer. It's a tech company that happens to sell pizza. So now you can get your pizza on South Beach or in 150,000 hotspots in public places across the US. You don't have to be at home or in the office or anything. Um, and this example here is actually a e uh, Kindle type book that's been written exclusively to sell you products. So when you read this story about this young woman falling in love, when she wears a red dress, guess what? You can click through and buy that red dress through the book. So it's kind of this, you know, when we, when we saw Fifty Shades of Grey rise to popularity and we all suddenly started buying masking tape and um, <laughs> <laughs> that was an accident, a happy accident as it turned out. But this is the other, this is actually kind of cynical. We are, they are, they've written this book to sell stuff. So again, there's a changing channel that's appearing everywhere. What's changing all this? Fairly obviously, it's technology. And just to remind you that, okay, we've heard all this before, digital, digital, digital. Um, but the point is, in case we didn't realize, this is really becoming absolutely exponential. Moore's law in the past meant that every two years, compu computing power doubled and processing power. Now it's happening in a matter of days, sometimes uh, even you know, hours. And all these things reaching saturation happen really, really fast. And we're not prepared for it. So to illustrate the pace of this change, look at all these brands here. Brands that we all use to live our daily lives uh, all the time. You know, whether it's dating or entertainment, I think, yeah, well, I won't to what was coming on later. Uh, but we, there might be something relevant to this later. Um, uh, travel, all these things. What do we, how do we do anything before Google Maps? How do we m do anything when we didn't have Wikipedia? We heard a little bit earlier about Encyclopedia Britannica. Um, just to bring this to, we all know this already, but just to bring this to life for us, I want you to vote very quickly on which of these brands you think is actually the oldest, which has been around the longest in this, in this world. So I'm going to give you five options through Slido to make this simple. Uh, and you can now tell me what you think now. So which is the oldest of these five brands? Wikipedia, TripAdvisor, Amazon, ASOS, and Google. All right, so most of you are going with TripAdvisor right now, which is interesting. Not many people think ASOS is very old. Uh, and then it's a kind of three horse race for second. All right, so you think TripAdvisor. Interesting. Um, but it's a, Wikipedia is coming right up on the inside, as is Amazon. Uh, Oh, I want to see how this finishes, but we haven't got time. Okay, we'll call that a win for TripAdvisor. Um, well, interestingly, you are wrong. In actual fact, um, the oldest of those companies is Amazon. Interestingly, not yet 25. It's actually still currently younger than at least three of One Direction and Ariana Grande. <laughs> and that is how I measure age. Um, so Amazon is, is the, mo the world's richest company. I'm sure you already know that. Jeff Bezos is the world's richest man. Um, but it's, it's still very much within pretty well all of our lifestyles, I would guess, or lifetimes, I would guess. Um, this is the saturation of getting lots of these technologies to market. 
um, just illustrates how quickly things are now getting to 50 million users. It's just a matter of days. So technology is driving this and the, the way that we're seeing new channels emerge. So let's make this about Bath and Body Works, obviously. Um, the point about this is all these new ways, or this fragmentation I'm talking about, is meaning that it, in, in terms of actually affecting people's decision making, when they want to get their hands on a product, that thing between supply and demand, the store now still obviously has a key role. We talked about that. But that role is probably changing. Um, it's now just one medium available, even just within the Bath and Body Works ecosystem, for us to interact with the brand and get our hands on products. Um, many of these, of course, you will well know. Subscription boxes, lots of social uh, loyalty schemes, e-commerce, you name it. All the stuff you need, you need to be doing. Um, and so the point is the store now sometimes has to apply, uh, supply just something very, very transactional and practical. Um, people want to come in for verification of their existing research. We heard about that before, that they've done a lot of research before they get to the store. They just want to come in, get a quick uh, verification of what they're buying, make a transaction and get out of there. Um, other times, it is a completely different journey. It's a marketing journey. It's an, it's an education journey. It's an inspirational journey, um, which is where I think you know, we're seeing a little bit more emphasis put on things like the sinks and actual trial in store. And we're going to come to that shortly. Um, and as we looked to, we heard about DMVBs just a few minutes ago, or D2C brands. Um, actually, they're actually starting to open stores, which is quite promising, because it remi re reminds us that stores are really important. Um, but actually, the way they talk about stores is very different. For them, this is really a marketing opportunity, rather, or an educational opportunity, rather than necessarily simply a transactional journey. Um, and at brands like MM Lafleur, they are not trying to create a retail transactional journey, because most people, fundamentally, if they can avoid going to the store, they will, particularly younger consumers. Uh, so what I want to introduce you to is two, two different types of retail journey uh, in the physical space. One is shopping which is a leisure activity, like what happens when you go to Italy and you wander around with a glass of wine and it's all rather lovely, um, versus you know, the functional admin of just getting your hands on products. Um, and sometimes, sometimes the journey that we're fulfilling probably is very much transactional, functional. It's a necessary evil. They've got to come in and get their stuff and get out. That's what Amazon Go is bringing one click online into the physical space. That's what's so interesting about what they're doing. Um, and so we have to think about this as kind of two ends of the, the same spectrum. One is the kind of what we've, I've talked to you last time about experience versus convenience. And this is a kind of spin off of the same thing. So to give you an idea what I'm talking about, this leisure activity here, if anyone lives in New York is going back there with me on the plane later, this is a new store on 23rd Street called Zao, where it can't be a quick journey because when you arrive, you have to fish your own dinner. Um, they hand you a, a rod like this. Uh, or, a, or a net, and people look pretty surprised when they first arrive because they weren't expecting this. Um, they have to, whatever they catch, they have to eat. You don't get the choice, uh, apparently. I'm not sure how that works with how, you, how much it costs. But anyway, um, and then, of course, you give it to the chef who actually makes it really nice, so it doesn't go quite that far. But it's obviously very experiential, very theatrical. Those of you who work on Broadway would probably find it quite easy to get down and have a look at this. Um, that's kind of what you'd call the, the leisure experience. But we're also talking about, uh, you know, and that's what we're seeing now, for example, with, you know, you know Aetna bought CVS. CVS now, believe it or not, you never thought of CVS as a joyful leisure retail experience, let's be honest. But they are starting to bring in health hubs and services, very much putting the emphasis on that rather than simply being a transactional strip light spit, um, um, lit space. Um, uh, versus here, on, which is all about frictionless, which is in China, they're, they're putting up all these little pods everywhere. They're little gyms. There's a little doctor surgery here. Where it's all done through uh, through digital. So there's this really kind of huge dispersion. Or, um, yeah, the, the spectrum is really, they're no longer this one thing in the middle. It's really, really becoming diverse. And where do we exist on this spectrum? This is the problem. Um, they're also now even running within CVS's yoga classes, things like this. It's probably not where I'd want to do yoga, but um, who knows? So my quick question for you, uh, and there's no right or wrong answer here, is where does Bath & Body Works currently sit on this spectrum? Are we near, near the shopping end of the experience, or are we down at the buying end of the experience? I've given you a few options. And what I'm going to do, actually, is put this up and then hide it so that you guys can't see what other people are voting for. Um, OK. So go ahead and vote. And then I'm going to secretly see what's going on. Um, because I don't want you to influence each other. Where do we sit? Are we about a fun experience, a leisure activity, experience driven, or are we, about, are we a very, really a necessary evil? And where do we sit on this continuum? All right, let's see what you guys think. So let's go show polls. So, overwhelmingly, it looks like 
well, both the top two answers are lean towards shopping and leisure, um, which is interesting. Some of you, a couple, one person by looks of it thinks you're actually entirely a necessary evil rather than something joyful. <laughs> That's okay. Um, or you're somewhere in the middle. Well, I mean, it's pretty obvious you need to be probably offering both these experiences in the same space. So I'm not surprised some of you think you're doing a good job of that. But where do we, where do we fit? Um, I'm going to try and avoid, because the buying journey often is all about um, what you talk about digital and e-commerce, I'm going to try and avoid showing you loads of apps because I know that I'll get a few eye rolls because I know that some of this stuff isn't possible. I want to look at some practical ways that I think we can do this. But first of all, we have to think about our shopper very quickly. Uh, who are we actually going after? Today, we're talking about forever young, young consumers. And the con essential irony of this, this consumer base is that on one hand, she's really, really social in terms of wants to be with her friends and shop with her friends and also wants to be on social media um, and on the other hand, also wants to check things before she buys them. She wants to touch them in the store, as we can see here. But on the other, so on the other hand, she's totally freaking out. She's, she's got this millennial burnout we keep reading about. Um, and we heard earlier from Kathleen about attention fragmentation um, and the idea that brands are there to make life easy. So this is the kind of the irony we've got. We've got this. They want a shopping experience. They want to tr get their hands on products. But they also want to make things easy because they're really stressed out. And they haven't got much time. So I think. I'm going to try very quickly, I've got like 10 minutes, to go through a whole bunch of exa examples that I think sit at both ends of the spectrum. I think hopefully are fairly practical and possibly you could think about. So the first thing is about being social and sensorial. We heard about senses earlier with that great experiment we did. That's one of our real strengths uh, in the store because you can't do that online. You cannot leverage scent um, online right now. And the other thing is about curation and this idea of making the, the journey simple and easy and quick. So these are two ends of the same spectrum, which is fun and fast. Um, and we obviously need to be offering kind of both for different shoppers on different days, or yeah, or me, the same shopper on different days. Some days I want this leisure experience. Other days I just want to get in and get out and buy something. So fun, social and sensorial. The first thing is social literally meaning social media. And I won't labor this because I I've shown some of this before, but stores are social playgrounds. This is totally a thing for the last couple of years. Here's my good lady wife balls deep at the uh, color factory. That's, that's not rude. Um, uh, and here you would have seen the Yankee Kangaroo pop up about a year or so ago, where they really took this and ran with it. it was, I think you've all seen it, because it's right by your, your office in New York. But they're trying to create you know, social capital for Instagram, basically. And it's really straightforward. New York's full of places doing this, but it's happening all over the place. And frankly, it's kind of low-hanging fruit that um, I know you've got some neon um, lighting and installations in a few stores. I made the mistake of Googling uh, Beach BBW, um, which is <laughs> another thing altogether. Glossier, they give you the tools for social. You can uh, personalize your products themselves. But of course, Glossier, we heard about Emily Weiss earlier. They do a great job of bringing this into their, into their new physical spaces as well. So in Los Angeles, they've got this kind of canyon little space where you can take a selfie for your, for your Instagram. Of course, that's relevant to that part of the world. We heard about Death Valley earlier. Um, and here, I think I showed this last year, here's me at the store in New York. You know, they've got these little simple things. You look good, you smell good, it brings it to life. And you know, Scott was saying earlier, duh, this is like super obvious really for this generation of people who I prefer empowered rather than powerful. And actually for this generation, they want the tools to, to build their brand. And this is how you can help do that. I think this stuff's fairly obvious, but I'll, I'll, I'll talk about one more example, which is Smashbox, where they actually give you this really well-lit thing where you put your phone into it. It's lit beautifully directly for Instagram, uh, and also this kind of catwalk space they've got in, the, in their cosmetic space. You get the perfect look, you want to share it. They're giving you those tools in store. But um, I know you use the phrase retailtainment kind of a lot, and I think that's really interesting. Social doesn't just mean social media. It also means the fact that a lot of these young women, particularly, are interested in shopping together in groups and how you can leverage that to make this a place that they want to explore together uh, communally. And it's what we have talked about before with the, the bonfire effect, that you create this since time began. Human beings have wanted to congregate around things, around totems that they can believe in, both physical and digital, uh, physical and, I should say, mental. Um, so I, I noticed just when I was sort of waiting to get on the bus yesterday in New York that the store right by your, uh, near your office down on uh, this, just a couple of streets down from you, which is the um, Seven Straw. They've got like their, their, their sinks are front and center, the place to congregate and try things, uh, which simply isn't the case right now in your stores. I know there's reasons 
some of the reasons for that. They're, they're getting better lit, but they're still tucked away. And I think that possibly is a, a mistake. I've talked about L'Occitane before as well. It's not a perfect experience. But again, they're really heroing the idea of trial in the space, exploration of products. Um, taking it to its extreme, this is in China, Dear So Cute which is a, fit, a fashion store where they brought, instead of having the fitting room tucked right out the way at the back, kind of like we do with our sinks right now, they brought the fitting room experience to the front and center of the store. It is the experience in the store. So you buy your, you get your products, you go into a huge fitting room uh, where you're meant to go with your friends and sit and talk and maybe have a glass of Prosecco or whatever, and then you go outside into what is effectively a little catwalk space. The fitting room isn't something that's completely sidelined. It is the experience, because that's where you have to go when you're buying clothes. So how could we use that same idea? Glossier is doing it with communal wet bars here that you, where you, you, know, you have an experience together uh, and do it with your friends. Um, they've also did this collaboration with Ria's Cafe in San Francisco, which is this kind of hipster, very well-known cafe space where you could go in and have a, actually eat food whilst having a, you know, a makeover in the mirror, et cetera. They were serving things like really cool burgers. And again, they're using all the same language you've seen elsewhere. Um, to make this a communal experience, uh, it's not just a transactional journey. IKEA, I'm sure everyone here has at some point, point bought something from IKEA. Um, but they want to be all about sustainability. They want you to come back more often than every two years when your wardrobe falls apart. Um, they've just launched a new store in Greenwich in London where they talk about it as a place to meet, share, learn, and shop. And note that shop is the last thing that they're actually talking about. This is a space to learn and, be, and they want you to come back for lots of reasons, not just to buy more stuff to put in your home. So they've got a learning lab, which is all about upcycling classes and sustainability. They've got a rooftop garden that's about to open. Uh, and uh, you can also get the meatballs and all that kind of thing as well. There's some, there's some data that suggests why this is happening. And quite simply, it's because we're spending more money on things like, interestingly, aquariums. Maybe that, um, that restaurant in New York's onto something. Um, entertainment, pubs and restaurants, that's where, we're sp that's where young people, and all of us, frankly, are spending our money now. Um, we're spending less money in department stores in, on fashion. And for our sector, this is actually UK data, I should say, but I'm sure it's pretty similar. Um, it's, it's kind of just above inflation, but we're not, you know, we're not driving huge sales in stores um, this way. It's, it's all about entertainment you know, experiences. This is where people want to go. Um, Lululemon very quickly running yoga classes, I won't dwell on this. Again, the sink is front and center. You can sit down. They've got a photo booth. It's all very sociable. Um, I'm going to be really fast here. Um, sensorial um, strengths of our brand. Um, you can't leverage it digitally, the sense, you know, the smells that you get when you go to the bathroom here, when you work into one of our stores. Um, and that array is what we should be bringing to life. We heard about it earlier when we listened to these guys do that great presentation. Um, so a few stores are really doing this interesting ways. L this is a store in Leeds called Neom Organics, where in the front of the store, the heroes you walk in is a sense experience, where you go in and you basically do a little experiment, and it's all unbranded to understand what your sense preferences are, and that's what drives you, thank you, that's what drives you to make a purchase. Likewise, the perfumery in London, you do a blind scent test of all their products down the side here, and eventually they create a bespoke product for you, or they tell you the one you're most interested in. You do it by marking loads of things on a card. Um, basically, the same thing's been just completely stolen by Chanel, because it, it was, it's such a cool experience. Um, and a new collaboration that Macy's literally announced a couple of days ago is they're going to start selling their fragrances uh, in their stores by top note, not by brand, uh, by using some clever new technology that's with a company called Perch. So people are interested in this. Very quickly, Glossier again, they're playing in all these spaces. I just want to talk about them. Um, they've done this great pop-up where you walk in and they have this extreme experience <laughs> that's kind of freaky. Um, right it's social. You press a button in this little locker room. It's like a toilet cubicle. And then this happens. Okay. That is a hand. She freaks out in a minute, Do but um, so? I've got to keep going because I'm out of time. But experiential retail, this is what it's all about. Even in other sectors, borrowing the ideas of our, you know, Lush is one of our competitors, I, I'm sure. The bath bomb thing's been a great success. Even tequila brands and how boring the same uh, rituals and using them in bars. This is an, uh, a pop-up they did in New York on uh, Margarita Day. The other side of the coin, though, really super quick, is about uh, curation and clarity. And uh, this is difficult, because to segment our offering online is super easy. In a couple of seconds, I can get straight to candles and find the fragrances I want and the deals and all that kind of thing. In a store, let's be honest, you walk into Bath & Body Works, they're not huge stores, and there's a lot of stuff. Lots of smells, lots of colors. They look terrific with the gingham, but trying to get your hands on something 
isn't always as easy as it might be. Um, I know then you could curate it by spinning off things. I know you trialed White Barn as a standalone um, store, and I know that maybe wasn't quite the, what happened being the right thing in the end, and now what it looks like is actually inside. This is a store in um, Charlotte that I was visiting last week. Um, you're bringing that back in-house. But it's, it's hard to do it, to spin things off. Even IKEA, that well-known brand I just already mentioned, they tried to do a spin-off in, in London, which is a, a, a planning studio for their kitchens. And the problem was they use all the same colors and branding. So when I was in there trying to trial this out, because I actually just got a new kitchen, they, um, people were coming in with planks of wood trying to do returns. And they're like, you, you can't do returns. This is a kitchen studio. And so it didn't really work out. And so sure enough, their latest Spin-off of this is in Madrid, where it's differently branded, and they've, done, they've got a rolling experience, kind of like Story in New York, where every um, few weeks they change the whole content of the space. And the first time, it's just the bedroom. So doing room at a time in urban you know, city centers, rather than doing you know, the, the traditional big box store. So what ways might we create spin-offs? Um, it's, you know, there's a whole bunch of ways, but it's interesting that Lush has done a spin-off, which is just their bath bombs in Tokyo. It looks kind of beautiful, and it's, it's a naked store. The only way you can interact with the products is through the app, uh, because that's how you explore what's happening. It uses AR to identify them and then uh, tells you what it is. Um, but it's just a small format store just dedicated to bath bombs, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, and Uniqlo, believe it or not, is selling $10,000 worth of merchandise a month at Oakland Airport um, because it's putting its clothes its it's, warm, it's cold weather clothing. Obviously, in California, it's normally a bit warmer. Um, next to the gates where people are flying to cold places, and they go, shoot, I forgot to bring a down jacket. And you can buy it all bundled up real quick, and they're selling $10,000 worth of merchandising. So that's being relevant, but having a spin-off and curating something really simple. And the last little section I've run over is about giving customers control. So right now, we sell lots of products. It can be kind of bewildering when you walk into the store. And so we're starting to see a few brands experiment with selling one product, but in multiple ways. Um, and a good example of that is Clinique ID. This is basically 15 products. But rather than 15 different products on a shelf where you kind of go, whoa, tyranny of choice, I can't figure this out, they have one experience that has 15 possible results. So it feels kind of you know, special to you. You decide which of the things is most relevant to your skin issues. Uh, you pick a, a hydrating base, and then you put it together. Um, and this is what happens. I remember the music, but... Yeah. So, they're all at it, basically, and the merchandising is really clear. Build Your Own Birchbox did this exact thing, basically gave people control. We've seen it now with Quality Street in London or in, in the UK. At Christmas, every old aunt of yours gives you Quality Street, which goes under the Christmas tree, and you eat whatever, and what's left over is the stuff that no one likes. Kind of like when you have a you know, Reese's does something, doesn't it, or Hershey's or somebody. Um, what they've done very simply is give you control of that experience now, where you can actually personalize your whole Quality Street box and choose the ones you want. And, and it doesn't, you know, it's not a huge stretch to see how you might consider giving people more control to curate their own products in a different way. It's one experience, lots of different multiple executions of it, and that gives people the control. And the final example, just because it's a bit surprising, is even that we're seeing this happening in Kroger in frozen food. So even at Kroger now, you can basically build your frozen meal entirely yourself. You choose any combination of entries and sides, and you buy it based on weight. You take it home, you freeze it, and you eat it. So this. This, this approach that we're seeing, where you simplify the m bewildering choice into one e uh, execution with lots of, lots of possible results, really seems to be something that people are, are following up on. So just to finish, where do you think we should put our emphasis at Bath & Body Works as we look to the future? We want to stay relevant. Are we wanna, do we want to go down this shopping route where it's about social and sensorial? I'm talking about the store, of course. Or do you think we could do a better job of curating and giving clarity to our offering in store? So. This is your last chance to vote. Okay. There's no right answer, but it looks as though you're on the, uh, on the side of giving a more experiential, sensorial experience. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Play to your strengths in the store, because that's what you can't do digitally. Very interesting. I will share this data, um, if it's of any use, uh, and I'm going to let the next mystery speaker come up, but thank you. Sir, well done.